Well, welcome, Kim. I'm so, so excited to bring you on to my Core Connections podcast. We're going to talk all about sleep. And for everybody listening, if you haven't listened to me much, uh, you may not know this about me yet, but I am a big, big, big fan of sleep. We have to sleep for our health. Our kids need to be sleeping. So Kim, welcome. I'm so excited you're here. Thank you, Erica. I'm so excited to be here too. Because you know, so, I'm, I'm all about sleep. <laughs> all about the sleep. Yeah. So Kim is known as the sleep lady. So let's start there. How did you become the sleep lady? Why Why do you specialize in, in this? <laughs> well, by the way, I think it's super cute. I got actually the name, the sleep lady from a three-year-old. Um, oh, I love that. I was helping um, his parents. Uh, get him to go to sleep independently and stay in his bed and sleep through the night. And, um, and I call, I, you know, would call families and, you know, do, do my coaching work with them. And he would hear us talking about them. And he's like, who is that? Is that the sleep lady? And I was like, I kind of like that name. <laughs> So thank you to that little boy. I've been uh, using that name for 24 years. Um, so imagine he's, you know, a young adult now out That's there. Awesome. Um, yeah. So let's see, I'm a family therapist for 30 years, almost 31 years. And um, when I had my first daughter, who is 28, uh, at the time, the only thing out there was one book worldwide. Um, cause imagine, I know this makes me sound like a dinosaur. There was no really internet, so to speak, and definitely no Google. And so you went to the library and they only had, um, Ferber, which in behavioral sciences, graduate extinction means put the baby in the crib, leave the room let them cry. You were allowed to go in and check on them in timed increments with the idea that eventually they'll learn just to put themselves to sleep. And um, now one, we're going to leave out of the conversation, what's an appropriate age to start this. Um, and I did wait until um, my baby was ready um, developmentally. But I remember thinking at the time as a family therapist, well, what is she learning from this? Um, and how uh, is she learning how to self-regulate without any presence and help, modeling, support, and reassurance? Um, and so I thought, and I, and I remember thinking when I was in grad school, before I was a parent, the same thing about time out. You know, how does that work? Like I'm going to make my, this child sit in a chair in whatever, hopefully not a corner, but um, in a corner. Uh, and what if they don't stay in the chair? And if they're upset about something, how is that teaching them how to deal with their, that emotion? And so I was, it was that sort of same thinking. I didn't have all the answers because I wasn't a parent yet. I had, of course, the training uh, and the book knowledge, but I thought, huh, there's got to be something else. So I experimented on my daughter. I always say she's the cutest guinea pig I know. Um, <laughs> and she turned out great, thank goodness. And I instead developed what is now known as the Sleep Lady Shuffle, which is just a gentler method of sleep coaching where you stay with them at, you know, when they're developmentally ready, offering physical and verbal reassurance. You do less and less as you move away and they incorporate the skill independently. Um, and so I ended up, and please let's make sure to mention uh, something about when parents do more of a fervor method. I don't want them to feel guilty about that. So we can circle back to that. Um, okay. So what ended up happening is, you know, so I get my daughter sleeping pretty well and, but I still think I'm experimenting. Maybe I had some luck. I wasn't sure Then I helped my brother because his kids weren't sleeping and and it was his wife who was like, Kim, you got to add this to your practice. Because I started helping my friends. I helped them with their second child. And I was like, mm, let me work, have my second baby and let's see. 
Uh, I, had my I had my second baby a little early. She had a horrible silent reflux. And mm -hmm. she is one of these very alert spirits. So boy, was she harder to parent. Um, an amazing uh personality and spirit um, and temperament, but she helped me to be a better mom and a better sleep lady. And once I got her sleeping well, I said, okay, I'm on to something. And so I started helping friends of friends of friends. And finally I did, and I was doing it for free on the side of my practice to sort of perfect it. Mm -hmm. And cause I'm a little bit of a perfectionist and, um, and then finally, when I no longer knew who the person was who was calling me in reference to this other person they met, I added it to my practice and it really exploded on its own. Okay, um, that's I think, be, yeah, and I think it was because, first of all, I was doing what I loved um, and it kind of reverberated out, um, but also it was transforming people's lives. You know, oh, yeah. like if you have a baby that doesn't sleep through the night or a kid, you know, it's like marriages are torn apart um, and, you know, people get into car accidents, you know, they don't perform well on their jobs and, and they don't feel like the parent they'd like to be, you right. know, you have health so, issues and everything. I feel like so much of it starts or gets really exacerbated when we have babies because of the lack of sleep. I know I was someone, my oldest, and I was a little bit of like just not knowing and not knowing how to, what to do, how to do it right, the things I did, you know. And so, yeah, and she's 16 now. So it's been a while. So I'm yeah. like way out of the baby stage, but I want to help moms, you know, listening today. So, okay. So you mentioned the, you know, Herber method, that's just the cry it out method. And I never liked that either and never felt right to me. I just couldn't do it. I was, I probably did everything wrong because I just I couldn't let my babies just cry it out, you know, and which of yeah. course then maybe I suffered a little bit more or a lot more lack of sleep because I was a horrible like training at my kids to sleep. So how yeah. is your method different than just the cry it out method? <laughs> Yeah. So I usually tell parents there's a, and I have a podcast on this too, because I think it can cool. be very overwhelming with parents for parents to be like, what are the, how many methods are there? Are there, I've heard people say 30 <laughs> methods, 17 methods. I'm like, there's three methods. Okay. Everything falls under these three columns, parents. So don't stress out too much. So I want you, I'm going to go over three, the three, and then your job is to figure out what is in the best alignment with your parenting philosophies, your child's temperament, frankly, I'd add your own temperament, and what you think you can follow through with consistently, because that's key. And if you can't, like Erica, you knew you couldn't do it, you're better off just not doing it until you're ready, right? Yeah. Um, because being all over the place will unfortunately teach your children just to cry more. And nobody wants that. So right. basically there's true cry it out, which is called extinction in behavioral science. That means, which is Dr. Weisbluff, really, he was the first one out there to say that. Um, and then a few other books followed. Put the baby in the crib, leave the, of course, awake and aware that they're being put in there and leave the room and don't go in, period, all night long. That's complete extinction. The science says that that's the most successful because guess what? We can't go in and reinforce any behavior or give a mixed message to our child, right? So like yeah. most parents can't follow through with that unless you get one of these super easy babies that, you know, they cried five minutes and then they slept through the night. Like that baby has the best PR agent ever. Because I know I've never met that those those parents of those I mean of course maybe they wouldn't call me right because um, because it all worked out great but in general that's not what happens with most of our kids because if we teach our child that the way to go to sleep is to be held fed rocked whatever to sleep and back to sleep and then we say I've had enough and we don't do that then of course they're going to be like what 
<laughs> I don't know how to do this without without you. And if their pre-verbals are going to cry, and if their verbals are going to cry and have some words for you, um, like, no, mommy, no, daddy, I can't do it. So that's extinction. Then um, graduate extinction is fervor. What I was saying before, you can go in and check on them. Where you'll see lots of differing opinions, and there's no right or wrong, is um, whether you know you can pick up the child when you go check on them, whether you should touch them, whether you should have eye contact, whether you should talk to them, um, but you at least go in. I, by the way, am a proponent of responsive, you know, you respond, but then it's all about what you do when you respond, mm -hmm. right? You know, um, and then, and then the, the third sort of column is what they call fading or what I like to call parental fading, um, which is basically, you know, the no cry sleep solution, the baby whisper, pick up, put down my sleep lady shuffle that some people, um, take versions of and call the chair method where you, as I said earlier, you offer that physical and verbal reassurance doing less and less as they incorporate the skill independently and you, and you move out. So there's really those three methods. If a listener, which is what I wanted to say earlier, if a listener did, let's say fervor did graduated extinction and it worked and your child maybe cried 10 minutes one night and fought seven minutes the next night, and then they slept through or a couple times during the night and all is well, then please don't stress out about that. You know, I mean, what, what we, what I worry about are more parents um, taking one method at what, even if it's mine and doing it for like three weeks with no progress. You know, that means like stop either different method, go to your pediatrician, rule out, you know, something yeah. underlying medical, which, you know, mm -hmm. is, is definitely a factor. So picking what you think is the right match for your child and your parenting philosophy and what you can follow through with consistently. And I just wanted parents to have choices, you know, yeah, and not good. feel like cry it out or suffer for months or years. Right. So with your method, you're saying your, yours is more going in and checking on them, but being consistent with the modality in which you're doing that. Mine is more staying. So not oh, leaving staying in there, never leaving. Okay. Well, not never. Um, well, once so, they fall asleep, I should say once they yes, fall asleep. And yes. then every three nights you move farther away, okay. you know, so three nights by the crib and depending on the setup in the room, you may have three nights in the middle of the room and, by, and then by the door, or you may go right to the door and then the okay. hall view, and then you're pretty much, your child's got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's still, even if they're in there screaming their head off, you just sit right next to them and do, are you more like, like vocally, can we, do you encourage I'm all about to, parents to talk yeah, to them? Eye contact. It's okay, sweetie pie. You know, if they're um, standing, you encourage them to lay down. I'm a proponent of pick up to calm, not pick up and then I'll rock you to sleep um, after 30 minutes of crying, but um, absolutely pick up to calm. I mean, our, you know, children don't have mastered self-regulation. I mean, my goodness, there's right. plenty of adults that we haven't mastered self-regulation. So yeah. I, I really believe our children need, need our support. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yes. I think support is everything. Yeah. I definitely want to talk about the child age because, um, I, I work with moms that sometimes their inability to get good sleep is still because their five and six year olds are still getting out of bed multiple times a night and they're dealing with their own health. You know, the mom's dealing with her own health, severe health issues. And she needs her sleep so bad, but her yeah. five and six year old kids that are plenty old enough to sleep through the night are still waking up. So mm -hmm. let's talk about that. Like you said, like, so three and up, is it kind of the same from that three to six yep. year old? Okay. Let's talk yeah. about that a little bit, because I think that's that many times can actually be more problematic because you're like, wait, child, you know how to sleep. You've done this before. And then who knows what changed? Or, and then all of a sudden maybe, they start waking up again. Or maybe 
they didn't do it before too. Or maybe that, you know, there's um, that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It all, you know, I, I love to give this example um, of a 12 year old I worked with in my practice. Cause it, I remember reading this study that said, if a child doesn't learn how to put themselves to, to sleep independently, they are um, more prone or at higher risk for adult insomnia. And I was like, that's kind of a big stretch um, to say that because a lot happens between childhood and adulthood to, yeah. you know, just think about all the things we worry about. Um, not that a child's worries aren't big to them, but uh, then I had this 12 year old come to me um, or her mom brought her to me. And I took a little bit of a history and the mom's like, well, I used to, you know, nurse her to sleep. And then I used to, that stopped working. And so I would nurse and rock her to sleep. And then, you know, um, we would bring her into our bed and then she got bigger. And so I would lay down with her in her bed. And before you knew it, I was sleeping with her throughout the night. And then, you know, she turned nine and I finally said, I want to go sleep in my own bed. This is the mom. Um, yeah. I want to go sleep with your dad. Um, and I don't want to sleep here anymore all night long. And um, and so you're going to have to figure out how to do this. And she said, how about you listen to books on tape back when there were tapes? Um, doesn't matter. The same idea, <laughs> right? And so by the time yeah. I saw her at 12, she needed to listen to a book on tape for an hour and a half to put herself to sleep. And the only reason she was motivated to get rid of it is she wanted to go to a summer camp and you could not bring any technology to the summer camp. And so, and this was my first case where I was like, now I get that study. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so the point to, to all the listeners is, has your child learned the skill along the way of putting themselves to sleep independently? Or have we as a parent inadvertently always kind of just switched up what I call the sleep crutch? You know, I used to nurse you to sleep, right? Just like that mom. Right. Now I lay down with you. I rub your back to sleep. I give you some water. I did, did you know, this kind of thing. Um, and uh, then that's where we have to start, right? Is like okay. learning that initial skill of putting yourself to sleep and back to sleep. Um, and I just want to... Uh, I, and I'm happy to kind of walk through how we can do that. But I also want to say what's really important and often missed with these older kids is you have to rule out underlying medical conditions that sometimes are, we don't know what to tell our pediatricians, our pediatricians therefore don't ask. And mm -hmm. a lot of times, you know, I find that parents are like ashamed that their older child is coming into bed with them or still waking up and they don't tell anybody um, about it. By the way, 30% of children under the age of five have reported sleep problems. So that's not small. So again, you're I not know. alone, right? And it's better to, to rule. So just real quickly, top reasons, because whenever yeah. I do public speaking, I always I get- going to ask you. Yeah. Yeah. What I always they? get a bunch of parents are like, oh my God, this is my five-year-old. I never knew this. So top reasons are um, untreated reflux that's not under control. If you're an adult that's ever had reflux, you know what I'm talking about can wake you up, particularly if when you, you probably, if you had it when you were pregnant, you know, know what I'm talking about. Um, untreated reflux, asthma, mostly the medication that children take to treat asthma, but anything breathing related um, does that. Restless leg syndrome, usually connected to low ferritin levels, um, which is iron storage. And then the, uh, which now they're saying that one, this restless leg is, is number one. Now it's now surpassed obstructive sleep apnea. Wait, um, in adults or in kids, kids are getting yes. restless leg. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. So something with restless leg is, and kids waking up. I want to know your thoughts on this because when I work with adults, that have a hard time, you know, even falling asleep or they fall asleep, but then they wake up during the night mm -hmm. is making sure that they've, they have a little like kind of balanced snack with some carbohydrates and protein. Like, 
mm-hmm. banana and nut butter, apple and nut butter, things like that. Mm-hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that with kids also who have maybe a hard time falling asleep or waking up during the night, making like, have you, I don't know, maybe it's something you haven't even, you know, ever addressed with the nutrition side of it. It's kids and making sure like you, maybe kids just need to eat a little bit, of, a little snack before bed and see if that helps. Like, I don't know if that would work or not for kids. I know it can um, help adults, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, I would take, I'm not a nutritionist, um, or, or a physician. Um, how, however, I now worked with over 20,000 families and right. seen a whole heck of a lot of patterns and have incredible colleagues in the medical field who have taught me, um, and continue to teach me. Um, I, you know, I, I've had this conversation with a pediatric pul- pulmonologist board certified in sleep medicine doc and, yeah. and with the restless leg, it kind of makes sense to me and to him that there's like a gut component. And Mm -hmm. so if there's a gut component, then that's a nutrition component too, right? right? And so, um, because why is it that these kids are having low ferritin, low storage of iron? So- um, Bugs, they have bugs in the gut. My blanketed bugs, parasites, uh, overgrowth of bacteria, fungal- things like that. Just putting that out there for everyone listening, like yeah. it's doing testing to see and figure it out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you do, you do need to be informed and you need to actually ask for a blood test that includes ferritin levels, not just iron yeah. um, levels. And really, you know, we have to be our own medical advocates, you know, and do that research and ask those questions and ask for those tests. Um, and you'll, you're, if your child has re- restless leg, you will see this, you know, um, they may complain like itchy legs or any can, by the way, have it on your arms too, you know, or a tingly or a kind of like, it's like, it's hard to stop moving your body. Um, and it's uncomfortable. Um, and it's usually when you're trying to be calm, um, and go to sleep. Um, so usually I haven't seen it, uh, treated with, for instance, a snack before, um, bed. What they usually do is give you high levels of iron and obviously don't do this on your own. Go get it. Yeah. You want to test it for sure. You want to get tested. You want to figure out what's high level. But what the good news is, is then the idea is that once you get it back to where it should be your storage of iron, then a healthy diet will keep it there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And and then and that's this is like organ meats and uh, I don't know. like that. Right. Well, I'll Blue say that because I'm an, F- I'm an FDM practitioner. I'll say that organ meats can Perfect. be really, really good for uh for kids and for, you know, red meat and things like that for keeping those iron stores there. But retesting, I will tell anyone that goes on iron, you, you want to retest and they usually like 90 days to see level, like you want to wait 90 days and then retest because it can take 90 days. And then you kind of want to check every 90 days to see where the iron, your iron levels or your child's iron is. You really want to keep an eye on iron because yes, there is such thing as too much iron in the body as well. (laughs) So I would believe it. I would believe it. Um, we saw a real increase in, um, uh, restless leg during COVID too. Interesting. Mm. That is um, interesting. Stress. I mean, we know stress. Well, we know stress does so much to the body. We know stress affects digestion. So mm-hmm. there's, I always like connecting the dots for people. And I'm like, well, stress affects digestion. So if you're starting to have malabsorption or stress okay. is decreasing the, you know, kind of your the environmental aspect of your microbiome, right. like it allows for more bad things to flourish in the body. Yeah. Like that's the easiest way of kind of putting it right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that is interesting in though. Stress yeah. about sleep. The, the other thing I wanted to just mention, because this one is so um, often missed is obstructive sleep apnea. Most people think, oh, well, kids can get that. Uh, yes, of course, you know, obesity is a factor, but so are just enlarged tonsils and adenoids. 
right? And so um, if a child is um, sweating during sleep, particularly on their head, very restless sleepers, like pillow and the blankets on the ground, you know, um, uh, that uh, loud breathing, they don't have to snore, right? Even if it's mouth breathing, loud breathing, those are like really the top three. And then if you start adding things like frequently congested, history of reflux, has mild asthma, and, you know, bedwetting, um, you know, all these kinds of things, then I, I really want you to go back to the pediatrician. They can do an x-ray of the adenoids. Um, they can look in the tonsils, you know, sort of, not super as well as if you went to an ENT and they scoped your child, or you can have them order uh, a sleep study. Yeah. And usually removal of tonsils and adenoids is um, what happens at, not always, but that's one of the treatments. Sometimes they may try shrinking it with a nasal spray um, and other times uh, they may not be able to. Yeah. Something else I'll just add for uh, moms listening is um, tongue ties with breathing. Just that's a whole deep slope I've gone, deep rabbit hole I've gone into. And so I just always yep. want to mention that with sleep and with breathing mm -hmm. with your kids is just something else to rule out. So mm -hmm. yeah, very important. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So, so Kim, what are, when it comes to kids, kind of that three and up, and like you said, even 12, maybe, yep. right? Like mm -hmm. what are some of kind of recommendations that you have for helping them to be able yeah. to go to sleep on their own, no matter yeah. kind of what we've done prior to that. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> so just so you know, this is my favorite age group um, to work with, mainly because I just love all the amazing things they say and just, you know, who that age group is just so wonderful. I'm not saying that they can't be difficult to parent and little <laughs> attorneys and always negotiating a hundred percent, been there, got it. Um, uh, so, so the first thing is, is that I always encourage, well, first of all, I always recommend a gentle method with kids in beds because the, you know, silent return, which is put them in the bed, close the door. Every time they come out, walk them back, they come out, walk them back, they come out. Well, usually at some point, somebody's losing their temper mm -hmm. or patience at the very least mm -hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> ends up with everybody crying. And it creates this anxiety about bedtime um, and doesn't really create a calming environment to begin with. And I always try to remind myself too, is that if a three-year-old or a four-year-old is um, not able to put themselves to sleep, it, it it's very likely because we've been helping them put them to sleep. And so when we stop, they're going to be upset and not understand and not automatically know what to do. I mean, I've had kids say to their mom, but I don't know how to mommy, you yeah. know? And so, so I always start with, um, everybody's in, like, I got to have both parents. Ideally I'd like two adults, but if we only got one, I'll take one. But then that one has to be 200% in and not, and they have to dedicate three weeks at least like don't be traveling or going camping, like set yourself up for success, make this your priority and first um, have a family meeting and say, you know, I always like to say, blame everything on me, say mommy talk. And I just say mommy, cause I'm a mommy insert, whatever you like to call yourself or daddy or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mommy talked to the sleep lady today and she told me that I was supposed to teach you how to go to sleep without laying down with you when you were much younger. And so now I'm going to stay with you while you learn how to do it. So notice how I say, I realize I kind of messed up in the past, but we're not falling on our sword, right? <laughs> um, and I'm saying, I'm going to stay with you while you learn, right? And help and help yeah. you through this process. And I usually love a sleep manner chart, not for rewards, not for stickers, but for to helps the parent and the child 
um, remember sort of what they're working on. What is our goal? Okay. So it's like cooperates <laughs> at bedtime, put self to sleep quietly without mommy laying down with you, um, uh, put self back to sleep in the night without whatever mommy laying down with you. And then I love a toddler clock, uh, put self to, um, uh, stays in bed quietly until my toddler clock goes on. Right. And so, um, so you say, this is what we're going to do. And that means mommy's not lying down with you anymore, but I'm going to stay and sit with you while you put yourself to sleep. And then there's no more sleeping in, in mommy's bed. And mommy's going to sleep in her bed and Ryan's going to sleep in his bed, you know, kind of thing. And, um, and so you start, this is where, again, the sleep lady shuffle. And so you have your, your first night. And if you used to lay down with them, your big thing is you have your routine. Oh, I should remember to say about picking bedtime. Let me make a note. So I remember to do that. Um, you have your bed soothing bedtime routine. I'm a big proponent of picture books, so much amazing research about reading in particular picture books um, with your child. Um, no phones in the room, real, really present for at least 20 minutes. Um, it's also honestly a great time where your kids tell you all kinds of things about themselves yeah. and their day and their life. It's really yeah. a night, really a beautiful connection time. And um and then you go over your sleep manners and then we have our, you know, our routine and then lights out. Maybe you have a nightlight, whatever you're, you know, usually I like a dim nightlight. Um, and then you stay there offering physical and verbal reassurance until they're asleep and you're going to move out, you know, three nights by the bed, three nights by the door, three nights hall and view. And then you're doing pretty well at that point, about ten, seven to 10 days in, um, they're largely sleeping through the night and going to bed quicker. Um, but you're dealing with early rising. Um, and, um, and you kind of go that way. And so a lot of parents say, Oh my God, Kim, am I going to be like stuck in their room? Um, that sounds really <laughs> tiring. And I say, no, you're, first of all, it's, we're going to, we're moving out. And, and frankly, you already are stuck in your room, <laughs> right? Exactly. Uh, we're going to exactly. slowly move out as they, um, um, incorporate the skill. And in the morning, you're going to go over like, Oh, did we, did, 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 you know, um, and continue to move there. And I have had kids who, which is the cutest stories, um, bring their, I usually give them a certificate with stickers, you know, when they start sleeping through the night. And, uh, and they bring them to preschool show and tell. Oh, <laughs> so <laughs> Cause, sweet. Because they're proud of themselves because yeah. I usually say, you know, you're going to learn how to, you know, sleep in your bed all night long, just like whatever, an older cousin, just like some, you know, somebody they yeah. sort of admire that's not too old, but, you know, older than them. And they really so, are proud. Yeah, that's awesome. So Kim, do you kind of do the same thing if they wake up during the night? Because I feel like that's like, the waking yeah. up so you kind of would do the same thing but then you're having to this is where I feel like as a tired mom I'd be like uh, I'd, 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 I'd have to like really hold really strong so like in the well, middle of the night to get my kid back in bed and then have to be like sit by the door until they fall asleep which you know that yeah. to me like sounds tiring parents, it does how do you get parents over that that piece well so I always remind them like look you're already tired and we're turning them 20 times. And mm -hmm. I know that, you know, the quick and dirty is just to let them come into your bed, but you're telling me that you don't want to do that anymore. And so remember what we said in the beginning, I don't want you to start until you're 200% in. So I know ah, you're gotcha. tired okay. and you're going to be tired just for a few more weeks. Um, but then there is light at the end of the tunnel. And so I have you, but again, I've seen parents who literally are returning their kids 20, 30 times. And then I know I've heard those stories lock them in like... the room and hysteria <laughs> and you yeah, know, that's no good. Yeah. And, you know, it becomes a whole other issue. So mm -hmm. I always say, you know, you bring them back and, um, and you're using the toddler clock and you're like, oh, your toddler clock's not on. 
you have to get back into your bed. Remember our sleep manners. We have to stay in our bed until our toddler, until our light comes on. And so they get into bed. Again, I'm not saying now you rub their back or read another story. You're like, there you go into the bed. I'll sit here until you're asleep. Notice how I didn't say I'm going to sit here all night long. I'll sit here until you're asleep. And then mommy's going back to bed. Yeah. Um, and you got to keep moving right. because otherwise right. <laughs> they're like, oh, that's where mommy sleeps in the chair by the door. No, 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 yeah. no. <laughs> you got to work your way out. Yeah. Well, okay. When you said something in the picture book, so I'm like, oh, I did do something right. Like I will tell you when, once my kids were, well, my, my younger two were better baby sleepers, but once they got a little like older and in their big beds, we always would do the reading, you know, before bed and like that yeah. in the picture book. So I'm like, I'm like, that's really interesting. Cause that's exactly what I did with all of my kids. And yeah. they were pretty good sleepers when they were toddlers and, you know, don't have any issues. You know, there might've been a time here or there where they would get up, but I don't remember the like constant, you know, back and forth thing. I, we lock on wood never really had to experience that, but I have heard that yeah. from, some parents and so Absolutely. yeah this is good so thank you Kim for sharing yeah. all, sharing all of this <laughs> you know another real quick tidbit on that yeah. is that a lot of times we're putting our kids to bed too late so make sure that you're kind of doing the math backwards what time do they have to wake up are they getting that like depending on how old they are 10 to 11 hours at night and so and you're really looking for that tired window that we get yeah because if you miss that window, then they like get a second wind and it becomes, yep. yeah, yep. exactly. So Just you like you and I. That early. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. I love this. Well, Kim, this is so amazing. Um, is there any last things that you, we, you haven't yet shared about, you know, sleeping, whether it's with babies or kind of toddler kid age that you always love sharing with parents to help just create these healthier sleep habits for everybody? I think well, and you're going to like this. I think we need to make sleep a priority yeah. um, in our lives as families. Um, and luckily that's really gotten better over the last, you know, three decades that I've been, been practicing. We know more and more about sleep. And then I think the other thing is bringing back the story time. And I'm like, I'm going to bring picture books back before I retire um, because of the connection and safety and security that that creates before going to sleep that frankly is good for all of us. Um, and it's great for our children. And there's been incredible studies about emotional availability and helping our children be able to go to sleep and sleep better. I love it. The picture book. So something I did too, when my kids were, when they start to be able to sit in the crib, I would yeah. leave like a couple little picture books, cardboard, yeah. the cardboard picture books in their yeah. crib. And so then when they would wake up in the morning, they weren't screaming at you to come get them. They would just entertain themselves and look at books. And I swear, and I am such a big, just big, big, big fan. I, and I'm always sharing with moms. I'm like, get your kids into picture books. So this is so interesting because I've noticed that not only do my kids have a love for reading that I have recognized other children don't sometimes when they get into middle grade school, middle school, things like that. My kids all love, love to read. And then we have an array of reading skills in my house, but I still love books. And I think that you just can't, nothing replaces just that yeah. love for books, even if you're not the strongest reader, you have a child who ends up not being the strongest reader, they still can love books. And I would notice my kids, you know, when you read them those stories at night, like I always was like, with one of my kids, I was like, is she ever going to learn to read? Because she would memorize the stories because we read them over and over again. And so she would yeah. open a book at a really young age, read the whole, read, quote, read the whole thing. And she wasn't reading it. It was actually a memorization thing. Mm -hmm. And so I just think that like, I love hearing you say this because I actually have never heard anyone else talk about the importance. I've observed it. And I always try to tell all my mom friends, like, put those board books in their crib, just, you know, when you feel like they're ready for them yeah. and read to them every night with their books, because yeah. I just have feel like I've seen it in my household. And yeah. again, like I, we don't struggle with 
the reading aspect to get my kids to read books, like I've seen with a lot of other kids, once they get into that middle grade school or that like kind of third grade, fourth grade, where now they got to be reading chapter books. And I, we've never dealt with that. You can look at pretty advanced picture books because they're showing that picture books also help with imagination um, and creativity. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's, you gotta, yeah. it's not like go quick to the, the, you know, second grade picture or chapter books. It's still the picture books are great. And not to mention you can have your, your kids like find a particular illustrator in a book that they love and imagine going into the book when they're going to sleep and to, you know, have them have nice dreams and all kinds of things you can do for relaxation too. Yeah. I love this. Kim, thank you so much. I'm glad we got to have a great conversation about the importance of picture books. It's so fun. I wasn't expecting that. So will you share with everyone where they can learn more about everything that you're doing, get out, you know, find your books because uh, they sound amazing. I could have definitely benefited from them um, when I was having my baby. Awesome. Yeah. So pretty much everything's on sleeplady.com. Um, I also, not only uh, my books are on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and other bookstores, you know, books a million that, you know, all over the world. And uh, I also have courses, including um, all the way up to kit for kids up to six. I have coaches and I also have a potty uh, training course too, a gentle potty awesome. green. So everything's That's on cool. sleeplady.com. Same with Instagram and Facebook. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Kim, for sharing all of these tips with our moms. Thank you, Erica.